Ringel came to playwriting after teaching college English and then working as a technical writer, a career from which he retired in 2014. A lifelong devotee of art, theater, film, and classical music, he has had plays produced all over the United States. His full-length A Kreutzer Sonata about a talented Jewish piano student was awarded Best Play at the Secret Theater's 2017 Unfringed Festival and received its Long Island premiere in December 2019. Other produced plays include adaptations from Chaucer and Dante, a farce about gender-blind casting in Shakespeare, several mostly gay romantic comedies, and several one-minute plays including a very cute one about Chopin's minute waltz. He is strongly interested in classical traditions in music, art, and literature. Several of his plays focus on the lives of creative people. Major figures in music and literature figure in these plays, and he is also greatly interested in the art of adaptation. Some of his plays can be found at New Play Exchange. For this reading of What Women Most Desire, the role of Allison is played by Katrine Arafai, the role of the boy Tim is played by Joe Mac Miranda, the role of King Arthur and Narrator 2 is played by Dan Capalbo Jr., the role of Queen Guinevere, the young woman and Narrator 4 is played by Kim Eaton, the role of Tim's father and Narrator 3 is played by Samuel Barnes Jaffe, the role of the hag is played by Peyton Bristol, with Isaac J. Connor reading stage directions. Setting. Nowhere specific needed, but at various times can suggest the court, the world the young man travels, the clearing by the train station, and the young man's bedroom. Time, the internet age, that is, when Chaucer was writing. Synopsis. A college boy convicted of rape could be sentenced to death or life in prison. Queen Guinevere, however, will spare his life, but only on one condition. He's given a year to journey the world, and of every woman he meets to inquire the answer to the simplest of questions. What do women most desire? So many stories about men and all, the, all their troubles. Stupid carpenters, silly old rich men, dishonest merchants, all being deceived. And while the details differ, it's like always I am seeing double, for the outline always are the same, as I'm sure you have all perceived. A dumb old man, at least one young guy, and a girl he wants to screw. And the girl is always just a pretty young thing, while the story is invariably told from a man's point of view. Basta, enough, time to turn the tables and see for once what women want for men. And to that end, I've got for you a fable as narrated by this aging mother then, a beauty and the beast story for the sex sexes inverted, whose style you will agree is jolly and extroverted. And what's more, I'll tell you, it, I, I will tell you it to you entirely composed in rhyme. So without further ado, let's get started and once upon a time. Chapter one, the trial for rape. A college boy, an athletic lad, known campus-wide for being quite attractive. Like every boy in his fratern fraternity too, all he wanted was to constantly sexually active. Let's call him Tim. At one typical party where he got his date completely drunk, whatever slight moral sense that this uh, feather-headed boy ever had became in inactive. And so he raped his date, who unexpectedly replied by accusing him in manner totally proactive. Of course, he said, the sex was cons consensual. Of course, the really, he really thought. Am I really supposed to live my life like a monk? But the only part of consensual, sorry, I don't know that word. Consensual, she agreed, was the con. She said she was tired of boys who couldn't see no, meant no. And she reminded him of the old saying that says, too bad, you reap as you saw. He found himself facing a trial 
and at best 50 to life in jail. How can this be? Why are they all picking on me? When all those guys do this at least two or three times a week. But the young woman wasn't intimidated. The court set a million dollar bail. The plaintiff merely wanted justice for herself. Though not justice every male or even every Greek. His father sobbed. Such a fine young lad for 20 minutes of fun was what he did so bad. He had his whole life ahead of him and now must he be punished with death or life in jail when he was just a boy doing what all young men most enjoy. King Arthur um, scold and clearly felt the father should be Adm admonished. You malignant buffoon, stop baying to the moon. Should the time spent committing the crime have any bearing on the sentence? Perhaps if I saw some sign in the boy of genuine repentance. But there's none of that here. The kid just sits here with an idiotic grin, showing not the slightest understanding of why he did what, 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 what he did was a sin. He should be put to death, in my opinion, and that soon or at least be sent to bed without his supper. Uh, at this point, it's, it's clear I must intercede. Such a punishment would serve no ends. In other words, there's no need. And so I would protest, even though many girls he did molest. He's not like a building that should be condemned, but more of a fixer-upper. Don't look at me like that, my lord, but listen to what I'll advise. That's better. It seems you finally learned to obey me is always wise. Now as for you, boy, and I'm saying this with a frown, instead of punishment, my goal is always to educate and instruct. I'll set you to task. It's not too much to ask, but if you let me down, I promise you, you'll be, well, locked up in a cold, dark, damp cell as you really deserve, with nothing but bread and water for the rest of your life. In other words, you'll be fucked. Now here are my terms. I'll give you a year not one day more or less, to answer one simple question which should cause you no distress. Tell me, what do women most desire? Come back this day next year with your answer, you, the answer you find. Now get out of here, the clock is ticking, so get busy before I change my mind and give you a licking. Chapter two, the quest. The young man scratched his head. He thought the answer was obvious. They all want me. But even his father said that probably couldn't be right. And so the lad named Tim dis disguised himself. His face was pretty well known. He dyed his hair. He dressed in rags. He grew his beard till it was fully grown. He started by updating his Facebook page to keep expenses from growing. At length, he renewed his passport so he could travel both high and lowing. He visited, among many other destinations, such nations as England, Sweden, Mexico, Greece, Texas, yes, Texas, Spain, Canada, the Congo, Kenya, Brazil, Tibet, China, and Japan. Places safe like Bangor, Maine, and dangerous like Iraq and Iran. There wasn't a spot on earth, you see, that wasn't a part of his plan. He journeyed by plane, train, car, bus, foot, gondola, cruise ships, helicopters, and camels, as well as every convenience known to man that could be defined as a mammal. He asked a question to every woman on the side or the other of the pond, and every female whom our young man encountered was eager to respond. One woman wanted to be president. Another wanted buckets of money. A third desired a castle where she could be resident. The next wanted only a well-hung honey. Some wanted to star in lesbian porn, while one woman from Azerbaijan wanted to master the English horn. Some wanted women, most wanted men. A few craved an expensive wardrobe from Balenciaga. Some yearned to climb Mount Everest, others to live by their pen, to write epic poetry, an adaptation of Chaucer, or the great American saga. Riches, power, beauty, 
talent, attractive kids, 5,000 pairs of shoes, a Lamborghini, a Fiat, a Picasso, or to travel the world of an endless luxurious cruise. Still another wanted nothing more than an exceptional musical ability. Some had more modest goals, merely to be treated with civility. Some wanted to cry, me too, and get justice from, from predatory men. Some wanted no kids at all, others numerous children. Some wanted a comfortable chair as an ultimate life's ambition, while one wanted to co-sign all men to everlasting perdition. But all these answers only confused poor Timmy every, even more, which is not surprising because he is kind of dumb, especially since all he ever did in class was snore, which left his mental powers kind of numb. At length, after traveling in the world for a year, he felt increasingly frustrated and being forbidden to have sex with women every night, at least twice, he masturbated. But feeling no closer to a solution with one day left, he started for the court. His eyes were sobbing. His head was throbbing, thro throbbing. his hopes bereft, sorry. Uh, he only thought of the jail time they would be lobbying. Chapter three, the girls in the clearing and the hag. But on the train home, with the court date quickly nearing, our boy kept thinking. The answer must be simple. What am I missing? Am I really that dumb? As the corners of his mouth curled contritely in an uh, appealing dimple. But a curious thing had been happening this year. And had you asked the woman he met, some might concur. concur. He had started to think not only of himself, but to think first more of her. Close to home, his train stopped at a station and he saw through, uh, through the woods a sunlit clearing. He won't believe what he saw there, which made him get off the train even though he hadn't reached his destination. 24 thudsome playboy bunnies, 24 naked girls singing and dancing at such a lovely sight. As this, the young man's penis started pr prancing. He uh, journeyed closer to the dancing maids, every one of whom was totally a Venus. While the excitement of thinking, I have to die tomorrow, at least I'll finally get laid. Translated to his youthful thro throbbing, etc. But when he reached the clear, clearing, all the girls had disappeared. He bitterly rea realized it had all been a hallucination. For instead of 24 dancing girls, there appeared a sigh grotesque beyond all imagination. A chill came over his youthful limbs. A fever racked his head. His heart dropped, his throat choked, his... Uh, very young member turned to lead. It was a wiz sorry, English is not my first language. Wizened crone who must have been at least 103. As hideous a sigh to our Timmy as a hideous sigh could be. She was shriveled and uh, pokemarked, hunchbacked and tottering with a cane. Two cataract clouded eyes, a deformed ear, a huge carbuncle on her nose, teeth r rotted black, from her neck a bulbous goiter grows, and the weary, wiry thatch of gray hair like, like an uh, overgrown lion's mane, a twisted mouth, and from hair face from her face, let's venture south to see breast dried to dust, shriveled limbs, and long nails like claws, organs of increase, no doubt, long past menopause. 
and skin as green as the witch from the Wizard of Oz. But still, the young man reasoned. Old people are supposed to be wise. And having no other option, perhaps I can ask, ask for her advice. The boy explained his year-long confusion, at which the old crone cackled with the cacophonous tones of a crow. So why didn't you come to me before? I could have saved you 50, 57,000 frequent flyer miles and more. The answer you seek is easy, you see. The difficulty totally an illusion. The solution, in fact, is so simple as to be a crashing bore. Of course, I'll help you, my lad. Your plight, my maternal instincts, does inspire. But bear in mind, my assistance comes with a price. And so you must also offer what I myself desire. What choice do I have when tomorrow the guillotine is likely to chop off my head? If you can help, I'll give you all my money or some jewels and gifts instead. First, let's solve your conundrum. For when you appear before your panjundrum, so when they hear your solution, they'll all cry, Amen. Just think about all those answers. What point in common ties together this thread? I can't see any connection. You poor dear lad, toward whom I feel such affection. Why, all they want is sovereignty over men. So why did I never think of that? I'll give that answer a 10. It now all makes sense. It, should have been a, it shouldn't have been a surprise, but sometimes you can miss the thing that's right before your eyes. Um, what does sovereignty mean? Chapter four, the reprieve. He returned to court, hopeful his life would not be cut short. Then he gave his answer at which all the ladies smiled and Massa. Even the girls our young man had deceived looked pleased. The boy's heart uh, gladdened. He felt relieved. And one enormous lady couldn't resist patting his shapely ass. The boy turned to the loathy crone who helped him to, uh, to help him the truth to see. He thanked her profusely. She nodded uh, curtly and then demanded her fee. He took out his visa, the one her, he nearly lost climbing the Tower of Pisa. But this most ancient of women scornfully replied, Save your gold. Don't want your money. But pretty honey, prepare your bed. For all I want is that you and I be wed. Chapter 5, Wedding Night. Big boys don't cry, a big boy told himself crying. Cause like, it or, Cause like it or not, he knew he would made a deal. The wedding was brief, which itself was a relief. And as they went to bed and stripped with delight, the hag let out a squeal. But as he looked at his bride, the boy could not conceal his revulsion. It were better I had died, he thought, his body racked with convulsion. You shallow, callow fool. Don't you get it? I've spelled out the rule. It's time for you to fulfill your husband's duty. So what should it matter if I'm no longer a beauty? With looks like these, what other man would want me? So what would you prefer? a loathsome hag who's always faithful? Or would you rather always be jealous of a sweet young thing who'll be rebellious and drive yourself insane over a wife you would think is always cheating? Oh man, this is hard. So much rides on this decision. If I asked, can you decide for me? Would you treat me with derision? Oy vey. You really are dumb. I know. Have you I'm forgotten already? Must I repeat the answer? So kiss me, you fool. Be happy that over you I'll rule. And now with your lips give your bride her well-earned greeting. So he closed his eyes. They were a grayish shade of green. And with his lips he sought the face of his queen. Now open those peepers. 
his sovereign commanded. And, uh, and knowing he had no choice but whatever his lady demanded, he opened his eyelids and then saw to his delight no decrypt old hag, no creature of blackest night, but so lovely and sweet a young girl as made him want to swan. And that's how they lived through eternity, never changing. Two lovely young people, never growing old, their eyes never ranging, ranging. And they made love three times every day from night to noon. Epilogue. Now that's the late Master Chaucer, a man tells, but let me ask you true. Did not this lad not only get away with a serious crime, but had his cake and ate it too? And would Queen Guinevere have been otherwise so willing to spare a less attractive lad whose fate, as Arthur said, should have been his killing? <coughs> sorry. The witch too got the prize the most desired, a boy with a bubble, but and cheeks this, and the rosy hue of apple brandy, for so she re reasoned, and her reasoning was inspired. Why shouldn't girls as well as boys enjoy their ocular candy? Now here I am, old Alison, married 47 times and hardly a thing of beauty, which doesn't mean I wouldn't want to enjoy a boy with such a cutie. But if you believe this tale, why are only the pretty people entitled to affection. And wouldn't you grow tired of a boy like Tim, who has nothing to offer but his six pack and his erection. You could never talk politics, literature, philosophy with him. Anything intellectual is taboo. And if ever you would bring up even a hint of an idea, you would say. Come on, babe, what the fuck? I wanna screw. And then with a sigh, you realize nothing can compare with the pretty wavy wrinkles in his honey colored hair. And so you come round and you say to him. Me too. End of play. <laughs> All right. So yeah, thoughts. Uh, I, will, I will share really quickly. Um, I'm sorry that I forgot to do this initially with his bio. But Larry's a friend of mine who was uh, a playwright. Um, he's written numerous plays in the New York City area. And I was in the last production of a Kreutzer Sonata um, that was well, very well received. And uh, it was a, a really good cast, uh, especially if I do say so myself, uh, the lead who is <laughs> an acting friend of mine uh, named Will Ketter. But um, yeah, so... Uh, Thoughts, thoughts on this? Uh, Peyton, your reading was so, so good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it was fun. Yeah. Glad I jumped in. Yeah, Larry, that, I love this play. It's awesome. I love the fairy tale aspects of it all. Thank you. Really great. Yeah, it was interesting. It was, it was not what I uh, anticipated from you, um, <laughs> which is, a good thing. And I try uh, not to write the same thing twice. <laughs> yeah, so far I've only been privy to, um, I guess, the two that I've been in that you did, and then the ones that you forwarded to me, but I didn't read them all. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, the other one that I was in of his was, uh, it's called Brian's Poems. But anyway, not to take away from this piece, it was, yeah, it was, it was really refreshing to have something um, that's kind of period-esque slash Shakespearean-ish. Like it was, it was an amalgam of certain things and made for something really unique. And I liked that there was a moral behind everything. I really enjoyed that. What are you, anybody else have thoughts on, on the moral that they took away from this? Oh, the moral. Um, the prose was very clever. I like that. Yeah, I liked how it combined uh, the two different periods. Like it, it combined uh, the prose of, of the old English type thing and with the modern sensibility. I like that a lot. It obviously took a lot of 
time to figure out how to combine the two, which was very respectable. I liked it. And if anyone is interested, um, Larry actually does uh, Reader's Theaters weekly on Tuesdays, right, Larry? We, we right now, I'm hosting a Shakespeare group. We're going through all the canon. Um, we've done half of them already. Well. So, yeah, and the only reason I haven't joined is because I generally, like, like in the normal life as an actor, we're always in things at the same time as our contemporaries, so we don't get to support each other as much as we'd like. Yes. Um, but yeah, from what I can tell, your, your readers theaters on Tuesdays are going really well. And you're, ma you're mainly reading Shakespeare, is that right? Right now, we're, we're restricting to Shakespeare. Um, we w I want to get through at least another 10 plays. We've done half of them. And then we're going to start looking at the contemporaries. Johnson, Marlowe, Webster, uh, Middleton, perhaps, Decker. And then we'll branch out to perhaps some more uh, unrelated things. Larry, as, long, think, as long as it keeps going. Cool. Larry, can I ask you a question about your piece? Of course. Um, is there something, because I love the, I lo I'm a huge fan of Shakespeare and I love the diverse structure. Um, is there something you think that you can do extra with the verse sort of paradigm? Do you think that you, you as the playwright can do something more than just the modern speech? I'm, I'm interested in like, uh, because I think it's effective. I just, I'm interested in like, do you think it gives you like, cause it's, so, there's so many rules when you talk about for, you know, keeping iambic pentameter or just like verse or things like this. Did you think it opened up things for you that it wouldn't have otherwise? Well, it's not pentameter strictly. No. Uh, yeah. uh, to be legalistic, it's it's what's called accentual verse, where there are four strong stresses per line, but within each stress, you can have as many syllables as you like. This, in fact, is one of six adaptations I did from Chaucer, um, and they can each be performed separately or as part of a full-length play, which also has connective episodes in which Six act, six characters are seated in a waiting room at JFK, waiting for a flight to London that's been delayed. And like the general prologue of the Canterbury Tales, they entertain themselves by telling stories. So, in the full two-hour version of this, you have six characters playing a total of thirty-six parts. Um, oh, Larry, yes, I like that idea. Um, can you tell me again the ver the verse structure? What was it? It's called um, it's called rhymed accentual verse, okay. which is different from iambic pentameter, right. which is regular, mm -hmm. short long short long short long. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? In this style of verse, um, the rhymes the rhyme the lines rhyme, but um, with each line, you have perhaps four strong beats and as many syllables within a beat as you may want. You so, just challenged me. 